Hi everybody and welcome back. Um, today we're going to be talking about routine activities theory, which is um, <clears throat> similar in a lot of ways to, um, to Turns theory and rational choice theory in that it um, puts a lot of the motivation and a lot of the ideas about crime on the um, offender um, as, as someone motivated to commit crime. And a lot of the policy implications, again, are, are very, very similar. So routine activities theory, it's important when discussing theories in general to, to look at kind of the historical context in which they were established, right? And so it's, um, the, the name is not really indicative of what the variables of the theory are. However, it is an important name to remember. So obviously, just based on the name routine activities, you, you get the sense that it's people's daily activities that, that may cause them to be victimized. And that's pretty much right. After or during World War II, all of the men in America, not all, but a lot of the men in America were either in the Pacific or over in Europe fighting the war. We still had a lot of industry and a lot of business that still needed to be run here in America. Who was left to do it? Really, females were, right? Whereas historically, females kind of stayed at home and tended the house, they were now all out working. So these routine activities of women leaving the house left their houses open. Well, the men come back after the war's over, and guess what the women still want to do? They all still want to work, right? And so now men and women have returned to the workforce, and houses are still being left unprotected, right? There's no one home to call the police or to say anything if the house gets broken into. And so it's these daily routine of people leaving that kind of made them vulnerable to deviance. Now, with that being said, the main constructs or variables within routine activities theory are motivated offenders, suitable targets, and absence of capable guardians, right? And the basic proposition of the theory is that crime is going to happen when all three of these elements take place at the same time, right? So there's this convergence of time and space with these three elements. If you remove anything from uh, any one of those variables from the equation, crime won't happen. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? You could have a motivated offender in a room with all sorts of cash, but if there's 10 police officers watching the offender, crime's not going to happen. Take the offender out, obviously crime's not going to happen. Um, or if you put a, a criminal out in the middle of nowhere um, with no capable guardians, but there's nothing to victimize, well, crime's not going to happen either, right? And as already stated, uh, routine activities are basically just the things that people do in their lives or their schedule, right? If you guys ever wanted to break into uh, my wife and I's house, you guys could watch us for a day or two and have a really easy sense of when good times to break into our house would be because we pretty much do the same thing every single day. And so with just a little bit of of uh, watching us, you could figure out our routine and know that there would be no capable guardians home to call the police. I'm not sure that we have anything suitable in the house to steal, but um, notwithstanding, uh, if there was something, you could steal it, right? So here's kind of a picture of what routine activities looks like, right? We see that crime happens there in the middle with that physical convergence of these three variables. And if, again, if you remove any one of those variables, crime doesn't happen. <clears throat> Now, as far as the empirical validity of routine activities, right, the one major issue with this is that the motivated offender variable is never examined. It just assumes that people want to commit crime, right? That means that if there is a uh, suitable target and no one there, you will commit crime as a person. Everybody's a motivated offender if things work out properly. Well, does that really explain why crime happens? Mm, probably not, right? Um, it doesn't really show what differentiates people because not everyone is going to commit crime, right? Why will the criminal commit crime when the non-criminal won't? So for macro-level research, we found moderate support for this theory specifically in the form of hotspots, which we'll talk about later on in the semester with GIS technology and stuff. But micro-level research shows that normal activities of individuals do increase their chance of victimization, but really only very, very slightly. And the research typically indicates that those who commit crime are more likely to be victims. And the vast majority of people aren't doing that in their daily lives as a routine. <coughs> Excuse me. And so it's probably not the best theory to explain criminal behavior. I like this theory a lot in terms of its simplicity. However, the empirical validity really leaves something to be desired. 
Also, is this really a theory of criminal behavior? Well, not if we're not examining why the person's committing crime, right? It's really more of a theory of victimization, right? We're looking at why you're more likely to be victimized, not why someone is, is choosing to victimize, right, in general. We're looking more at who is the victim. Also, none of the variables in the theory are really directly measured, which makes measurement of the theory difficult even when there is empirical support. So it has potential to be a very valid theory, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on this theory to really um, flesh it all out and make it work properly. Now, the policy implications for this theory, if you notice, I didn't even change the heading on these slides. They were literally copied and pasted, but in a different way, right? Now, just reading these slides alone is not going to help you. You need to listen to what I'm saying as we go through these slides to understand why these are the same policy implications, but how they're different. So, the same policy implications are situational crime prevention and the use of defensible spaces, right? SEPTED is crime prevention through environmental design. It's this basic idea, right, of defensible spaces and situational crime prevention. So, when looking at this slide, what is this, right? Now, for deterrence and rational choice theory, this increases the risk. What are security cameras in, in routine activities theory? We don't care about risk or reward in routine activities theory, right? We care about a likely offender or a suitable target and the absence of a capable guardian. What are these security cameras? Well, in a sense, they're actually a capable guardian. These are guards because people see those and choose not to commit crime, right? They're guardians in a sense, or they could alert guardians to come check you out. What about all of these devices? What are these? Well, these make the target no longer suitable. It's no longer a suitable target to take this these pair of khaki pants because there's ink all over them, right? The hanger no longer has a function and therefore it's, um, the, it's not a good target. Same thing with all of these. The target is no longer suitable to steal anymore because of the physical structure of um, the displays. And finally, the layout of the store also could be a combination of capable guardian and uh, lack of suitable target because it is no longer um, desirable to uh, go through the store, right? All of these examples, again, are really doing some of those things. We're either making the target less desirable or we are adding in, in some capacity, some sort of... Um, capable guardian. And so you can see where all of these policy applications are pretty much identical between deterrence and rational choice theory as well as routine activities theory. And that's something very, very important to know and understand moving forward. So anyway, um, this is the end of routine activities theory and uh, I will talk to you all soon.